And now for our next amazing keynote speaker. Um, this is a person that I've been hoping to meet for a very long time, Dr. Kwame McKenzie, the Chief Executive Officer of the Wellesley Institute. And I'm hoping that after this presentation, he'll allow me to call him Kwame, and I won't have to call him Dr. McKenzie. I hope we're going to become friends. Dr. McKenzie is an international expert on the social causes of illness, suicide, and the development of effective, equitable health systems. He's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto and director of health equity at the Center of Addiction and Mental Health. He sits on the National Advisory Council on Poverty. He's a policy advisor, clinician, and academic with over 200 papers and five books to his name. He works across a broad spectrum to improve population health and health services. He sits on the board of United Way, the Ontario Hospital Association, and Community Food Centers of Canada. A Southampton University Medical School graduate Dr. McKenzie trained as a specialist at the Maudsley Hospital Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London, and Harvard University. His early clinical and academic work focused on developing community-informed, innovative strategies to increase access and quality of services. This led to advisory roles to the United Kingdom government and election to the executive of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, United Kingdom. His more recent work has investigated the social determinants of health and how they can be used to decrease illness and improve well being. In addition, in addition to his academic policy and clinical work, Dr. McKenzie is a past BBC radio presenter and columnist for The Guardian, Times Online, and more recently, The Toronto Star. Dr. McKenzie holds an African Canadian Achievement Award for Science, Harry Jerome Trailblazer Award, the Dominican of Distinction Award, is a former Harkness Fellow in Health Policy, and a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, UK. I heard the esteemed Dr. McKenzie for the first time when he was being interviewed some time ago on CBC television news about the work that he was doing regarding social determinants of health. And of course, it was music to my tired ears. I determined then and there that someday I would have the honor to hear him speak. Little did I know that I would also have the great honor to introduce that speech. Without further ado, I turn the floor over to Dr. McKenzie. Wow, okay, well, um, thank you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Quam McKenzie and Louise, thanks very much for introducing me. Um, I'm going to um, allow you right away to call me uh, Quam and I'll call you Louise. I'm uh, amazed uh, to be following, always amazed and always daunted to be following uh, Carol, a great talk uh, as always, Carol, um, and a very, very, very tough act to follow. Now I'm going to try and share my screen and I'm gonna hope that it all works perfectly. And I think we're okay. So, I've been in Canada for 14 years now, 14 years in Canada, uh, but some of the things um, from the UK have stuck with me. Uh, each morning when I woke up in the UK, I'd listen to the radio, uh, BBC Radio 4, had a morning show which was called Today 
and I used to listen to that. It was usually highbrow political news, but they had a lighter side. And uh, one thing I remember uh, making me laugh was an interview that they had of a woman who'd just turned 100. Um, they asked her about her life and then they ended with a question and it's a question that everybody would ask um, sort of somebody who'd reached 100. They say, well, very few people make it to 100 years old. Tell us your secret. Why do you think you live to 100? And I remember there was a pause and then the woman said to the presenter, well, I think it was my decision to get off the Titanic. At the age of 18, she'd bought a ticket for the Titanic's maiden voyage. She'd got on the boat in Southampton, looked down at the quayside and started feeling homesick. So she got off before it sailed and waved goodbye to other people. We all know what came next. On this journey between Southampton and the UK, uh, in Southampton and the UK and New York, the Titanic hit, hit an iceberg early in the morning. 1,500 of the 2,224 people on board died. But actually, your risk of dying depended on your age, your gender, and the type of ticket you bought. Over 90% of women and children in first class survived, but only about 35% of children and 45% of women in third class survived. One in three men in third class survived, but only one in eight uh, men in, sorry, one in three men in first class survived, but only one in eight men in third class survived. In fact, men in third class were less likely to survive than crew. Now the Titanic had a one size fits all strategy for, their, for a disaster if they'd hit an iceberg, get to those lifeboats as quickly as possible. But people who were in third class were in lower internal cabins, they actually needed more help to get to those life boats, and that help was not available. It was not part of the plan. The lack of help and that idea of women and children first explains why some people died and the others didn't. But underlying all of this, many more people would have lived if they had an equitable strategy that gave people in third class more help. They would have saved many more lives if they'd done that. And not only that, the Titanic would not have been one of the biggest maritime disasters ever. We should have learned, but we actually haven't learned that simple lesson in our health service. We have a titanic strategy. We should know better. And that's for our health service and for COVID-19. Now we went into COVID-19 knowing three things. First, we knew that 85% of our risk of any illness is social. The Canadian Medical Association have shown that. 50% is because of uh, factors like income, your, your life and employment and, and racism. 10% is because of your environment and 25% is your access to good quality healthcare. So the first thing we knew, 85% of our risk of any illness is social. The second thing we knew is that in Canada, these risks are not just theoretical, they're real. In the Code Red study in Hamilton, there was a 25 year difference in life expectancy between rich and poor. Indigenous people in Canada have much shorter life ex expectancies. Immigrant and refugee and racialized groups in Canada 
are more likely to get ill. And those same factors that make you sick are also linked to decreasing your access to healthcare and to poorer healthcare outcomes. In, in Canada, we too often see something called the inverse care law. People who are less sick, but have access to knowledge, power and connections, get more care than those people who are more sick, but don't know how to play the system. So we knew two things. We knew first, there were health disparities linked to the social determinants of health. And second, health services were not decreasing those disparities. But then we knew something else. There should have been alarm bells at that time. We should have known that there would be problems in pandemics uh, because actually we had the data. We actually knew that the risk of influenza uh, was different in racialized groups during H1N1. Actually, data in Ontario showed that Southeast Asian people were three times more likely to get infected with influenza during the influenza pandemic, the last one, that South Asian people were six times more likely to be infected, and that the Black population was 10 times more likely to be infected. So we knew three things, social determinants of health, health services not making things better, and that people who had increased risks uh, of health problems and racialized populations were more likely to be infected during pandemics. So we knew all of that, but despite that, we went into COVID-19 with a one size fits all pandemic strategy, a titanic response, which would predictably not work as well for some people as others. And that titanic strategy impacted with the social determinants of health to change your risk of illness. There are four ways that COVID-19 pandemic impacts health. There's the illness itself that has impacts and that is your, you know, more likely for some groups than others. There's the impact of the public health response. Actually, social distancing, physical distancing has health impacts, uh, increased rates of domestic violence, increased rates of substance misuse, increased rates of anxiety, and those also interact with the social determinants of health. Then there are the impacts of decreased availability of medical care. The same people who have increased rates of illness are less likely to get care. And they're the same people who are gonna have negative outcomes because of the economic, um, uh, the economic impacts of um, COVID-19. So we should have known better. We should have thought it through. We should have had a better response. We shouldn't have had a titanic response. And as the data started coming in, we started seeing our mistake. Because in May this year, the US started reporting that African-Americans uh, and the UK reported that Black Brits had at least twice the rate of COVID-19 infection twice the rate of hospitalization and twice the rate of deaths. Not long after that, George Floyd was killed and the two together were a catalyst for community-led uh, community push for sociodemographic data collection to understand what was going on here. Communities developed strategies for data collection but also wanted the data use. The aim was to make sure we had data so we could see whether there were disparities in COVID in Canada and to ensure that data was used to decrease those, those um, uh, disparities. In response to this community-led push, 
local public health units in Ontario and some provinces, um, uh, first of all, Manitoba, and then uh, Ontario started to collect data. And we found that things were a little bit worse here than in America. This public health Ontario data shows the risk of COVID-19 for uh, different populations. It shows that the Arab and uh, Middle Eastern, the Black and the Latin American populations have sky high rates compared to the white population, six to nine times increased rates of infections found in those groups. What this graph doesn't show you is that racialized groups get COVID younger and they have worse health impacts as well, a greater risk of death and greater social impacts. This is from a data that was collected by Statistics Canada, and it shows three different things about the mental health impacts of COVID. It compares the blue, which is the white population, with the gray, which is racialized populations. <clears throat> and it compares them on poor and self-rate or self-rated mental health, whether their health has got mental health has got worse or not. And then lastly, a, 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 a measure of generalized anxiety. And what they have shown here is that uh, the racialized populations have worse mental health during COVID. Their mental health hasn't necessarily changed as much during the lockdown, but they have higher rates of generalized anxiety. So it's troubling. Once we get the data, we found huge inequities. And of course, what's happened is the existing inequities have been exacerbated um, by COVID. Um, but there's been a response. Toronto analyzed the data and started to implement changes in their pan pandemic response. And the Public Health Agency of Canada have come out with this model, their pandemic equity model, to try and get people to produce better pandemic responses. At this day, we should be working with communities to develop new public health interventions uh, that will give better support to marginalized populations. But they also say we need better housing, we need better employment conditions, um, we need um, better health and social care because they understand that COVID has exacerbated in existing problems. So there's been some success but there needs to be more done. And there are four groups of things that I think we should do. We live in a country that says diversity is, is its strength. So we have to protect that diversity. In my mind, it shouldn't be legal to have inequitable health and social policy. Health planners should have to decrease inequities by law. They should not be able to set up health services they know will disadvantage some people. I think we need equity-based pandemic strategies. How can it be legal to set up a pandemic strategy that we know won't work for all. Why shouldn't it be mandatory for people to have equity in written into their pandemic strategies like the Public Health Agency of Canada is suggesting? But we should realize that all of these inequities happen because of social factors. And uh, we should, when we're building back, we should build back better. Those who have been hit hardest by the pandemic should get the most support. Uh, we should be building a new normal that
that is better than the old normal. So we need to decrease the impacts of the social determinants of health so that we don't have as many health disparities. The disparities that we are seeing in the pandemic are because of the disparities we had before the pandemic. But last, we need the ammunition. We need data to ensure that we can identify who is um, and monitor inequities. We should be able to ensure we can identify where those inequities are and monitor those inequities. In, in democracies, if you're not counted, you don't count. And if you don't count health inequities, they become invisible. So in conclusion, the pandemic, what the pandemic tells us is that the old fashioned one size fits all strategies that produce health disparities make us more vulnerable to pandemics. And that same thinking which ignores health equity and ignores the social determinants of health, makes low income, racialized old and older populations more at risk during the pandemic. See, health equity is about making sure we get help to the people who need it. It's about fairness. In my mind, it's about getting off the Titanic. Thank you.